is a sort of joke phrase about the story of the West from Plato to NATO. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Uncommon Decency. There's technically little difference between referring to Europe and America as a transatlantic relationship or as the West. And yet, you rarely hear the latter term outside of a conservative jargon. How did the West become such a cranky reference? Michael Kimmich wrote a book about it. We're also delighted to bring to you his expertise on Russia matters. For two years in the Obama administration, Professor, Professor Kimmich led the Russia-Ukraine portfolio at the State Department's in-house think tank, the so-called policy planning staff. We hope you will enjoy this episode and remember to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts so that other people get to hear about Uncommon Decency. Thanks so much for joining us on another episode of Uncommon Decency. Today, we are delighted to be joined by uh, Professor Michael Kimmage. Um, Professor Kimmage uh, is a distinguished historian. He teaches uh, history at the Catholic University in Washington, D.C., where he specializes in you know, the history of Russia, the United States, Europe. Um, he's also a fellow at the German Marshall Fund, uh, where he writes uh, variously on, tra- on transatlantic issues and, and Russia as well uh, from 2014 to 2016. He served on uh, then Secretary of State John Kerry's policy planning staff, uh, where he led the uh, Russia and Ukraine portfolios. Um, Professor Kimmage is the author of really several books, all of which you should read, but the latest of which I would really encourage our audience to head over to Amazon and, and get their hands on a copy. Uh, the book is, is fascinating. It's called The Abandonment of the West, and it's this sort of sweeping history of um, the West is a sort of an intellectual construct or a cultural kind of touchstone. Um, you trace a uh, professor in the book, the history of, you know, that sort of pro-Western sentiment that dominated much of American academia and diplomacy. And uh, my first question here is I want to start, I want to start with the book as a, as a sort of a starting point, and then we'll, we'll evolve towards more um, issues of the present. But um, in the book, you kind of bookmark that the, in the 1960s is the end of what you call the Colombian Republic. Um, and in the 60s, you describe uh, is, is an era where the West kind of no longer holds that sort of um, uh, that, uh, you know, that that grip on the American mind. And uh, you even you and I even, even spoke and I was really interested in how you spoke of President Trump as potentially the first post-Western uh, president, uh, by which I imagine you you, uh, you 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 refer to kind of his, his foreign policy stances. Um, I, I wonder if you could speak maybe to more of the cultural element. Are we ever going back to a culture that prices and celebrates our shared Western heritage? Perhaps. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't look especially promising uh, at the moment. Uh, and, you know, to take up your question, uh, you know, I'll start with a definition of the West, which, which I use in the book and um, which usually sort of helps to frame the uh, the conversation, the West can mean many, many things, uh, and many of those things uh, are contradictory. So if one were to write a comprehensive story of the West, uh, it would involve uh, Christianity, it would involve uh, capitalism, uh, it would involve lots of, uh, of geopolitics over time, uh, and it's a very messy, uh, difficult subject to capture. So in, in, in my book, what I tried to do is really write one about one strain of the West, uh, which I defined as a commitment to liberty and to self-government, non-authoritarian forms of government, uh, and is something that, at least since the late 18th century, is sort of a Euro-American project, cultural and intellectual project, and over time, first half of the 20th century, and certainly by 1945, was uh, a geopolitical project as well. Um, you know, there's a sort of joke phrase about the story of the West from Plato to NATO, um, <laughs> and it doesn't tell the full story of, uh, of the West, but... Uh, you know, sort of a decent phrase for thinking about the geopolitics of the West uh, in the 20th century. So I attempted to tell that story uh, from an American point of view and to get the main sort of twists and turns in the narrative from about the 1890s to, to 2016. Right. But how much how much of the West nowadays is just the political, um, uh, the political concept of self-government and liberty? And how much do you think kind of unites the West 
um, beyond those aspects, because you could you could make a case that saying, you know, Japan, for example, has self-government liberty. Um, a lot of Latin America has got self-government liberty in a different shape, of course, but they've got. So what distinguishes the West in that sense? Or, is, or could we also say that Japan and, and Latin America and, and these countries are also part of West? Yes. I mean, I think that in functional terms for foreign policy, um, the West is certainly uh, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, uh, much of Europe, uh, some countries in South and Central America, um, uh, and uh, of course, uh, the United States as well. Um, if you define it as I do, uh, largely as an idea, that idea is mobile uh, and has been certainly one of the most powerful ideas of the 20th century, and we'll see if it's a powerful idea in the 21st century, but it, it can cross cultural borders or civilizational borders uh, to be sure. And yet your question, I think, opens one of the real complexities uh, of the subject, because it's not uh, just as an idea that it appeals to Americans uh, beginning in the 1890s, it's as a civilizational heritage. Uh, and that's something that Americans were very eager to celebrate, often through the figure of people like Christopher Columbus and others who are understood to be the culture heroes, the historical heroes uh, of the West. And that becomes, as we can get into, a much more complicated affair uh, in the 1960s when that's contested and then there's uh, a large portion of educated opinion that becomes uncomfortable with the very notion uh, of civilizational discourse. And as I argue, and this is what the title indicates, there's simply less and less agreement about what the West uh, is. So on one level, the idea can travel very, very freely. On the other, uh, it is something that is rooted in the story of the Enlightenment that has some connection to classical antiquity, that has a kind of uh, imagination of the world and of ideas uh, that's originally European and then over time uh, Euro-American. And that's not a story of travel uh, and uh, and recreation. That's the story of a heritage or a lineage. So in, in a sense, it is sort of both of those things. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think for foreign policy, if you have a choice, you would probably want to emphasize uh, the open uh, cosmopolitan idea of the West, but to understand how it functions within the United States. And I think also in most European societies, the issue of a lineage or a heritage or a tradition uh, is equally important. Sure, and 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 you know that's that's one of the things that really that really fascinated me in your book is how you um, you delve into kind of that uneasy connection or even that tension between uh, the cultural kind of sources of what we've come to call the West and the geopolitical uh, way that we apply those principles in the actual state of the world. Right. And I want to shift gears here a little bit, professor, to, um, something that is also a main, um, subject area of your, your expertise, Russia, which interestingly enough, you know, is also, um, I, I would think, and I, I'd love to get your, your, um, your, um, thoughts on this. I, I would think historically, it's also a sort of like a battleground of the West. Some people, you could, you could argue that Russia historically, uh, borrows from the same sort of Judeo Christian, um, uh, you know, repository of, of history, etc. Uh, but in, in a lot of ways, you could hardly think, other than China, you could hardly think of a worse kind of foe to uh, the geostrategic West these days than Russia. And you, you have a very interesting report that I would really encourage our audience to go and read uh, with the German Marshall Fund and your colleague there, uh, um, Stephen Kill, uh, where you depict a Russia that is uh, internally challenged in a number of ways by COVID, by uh, the way that Putin has um, like many other leaders, but Putin has uh, mishandled it. Uh, you speak of the, the kind of the, the, the upheaval on uh, the east of the country. Um, I, I wonder kind of if you could delve a little deeper in how that is impacting Russia's foreign policy. As you seem to suggest in the report that these internal pressures, these internal problems that Russia is having right now with the pandemic may temper some of the aggressive posturing of, of Putin in, you know, but um, I, I wonder if you can kind of uh, expand on that. Sure, this is, uh, you know, it's a wonderful subject. And let me try to break it into a few, uh, into a few pieces. And I'll start with Russia. I mean, I think Russia, together with Turkey, is the, the most intellectually interesting country when it comes to the West. It's a much more dynamic subject in Russia than it is in the United States, because in the United States, the West matters in university curricula, it matters in foreign policy, but it's not an urgent concern of domestic American politics. And there's never been, you know, sort of uh, extended internal debate uh, about the West comparable to what you see in Turkey and, 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 and Russia. And, you know, you could also include Japan on the list of countries that have a deep connection to the West, a sort of fascination, a desire at times to imitate the West, but also countries that uh, 
travel in different directions. Uh, so I think you're entirely right. Russia is a part of Europe. Uh, it's a great contributor to European and to Western civilization. There's lots of neoclassical architecture in Russia. Um, War and Peace is a rewrite of uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad. Uh, and culturally and civilizationally, there are countless connections between Russia uh, and the West and between the rest, West and Russia. That, uh, to me, seems pretty close to being an objective fact. But when it comes to politics, there is, I think, a very stark deviation. Uh, and liberty and self-government have been aspirational at times in Russia, 19th century Russia. They're aspirational at the moment with figures like Navalny. Uh, but it's never been the political tradition of Russia. Uh, authoritarian personalist rule goes back centuries in Russian history. Um, and if you had to bet on who will succeed, Putin is probably not uh, a pro-Western Democrat, but uh, an authoritarian uh, somewhat in the Putin uh, in the Putin mold. So I think that there is a dividing line. Uh, there's a border. Uh, we spoke a moment ago about how mobile the idea of the West is, and it is mobile, but for whatever reason, it's never substantiated itself politically uh, in Russia. Uh, and that, of course, matters for the geopolitical conflicts during the Cold War uh, and now that the West has had uh, with Russia. So let me move to a second part of my answer, and then I'll speculate a little bit about where Russia is uh, at the moment for the third part of my answer. I think the West has to walk a very delicate line when it comes to its policy toward Russia. On the one hand, there's just the practical need to deal with the threats that Russia presents, whether it's disinformation, whether it's um, invading and annexing the territory of a neighbor, whether it's generating frozen conflicts as in Moldova and Georgia. These are the practical problems of foreign policy and they have to be dealt with in a sort of strong forthright way in the alliance really matters. The NATO alliance, the alliance between the U.S. and the EU uh, is a key instrument in containing Russia uh, in this sense. Um, where I think the West can sort of cross the line uh, and go into bad policy is on the more messianic uh, aspect of its mm -hmm. policy, and I do write about that in the book, these sort of two strains of the West in American foreign policy, the legalistic and the messianic. And frankly, the messianic policies in Russia have never worked. I mean, Woodrow Wilson sent soldiers to uh, to Russia shortly after the revolution in hopes that he would make a democracy of Russia then. Um, there were great hopes in the 1990s that I think were quite uh, exaggerated. Uh, and, you know, the success of Western policy in Russia is not the Westernization of Russia. If that happens, that will be done by uh, the Russians themselves. The success of Western policy is, of course, keeping itself safe and also managing conflicts with uh, one of the world's major uh, nuclear powers. So, um, when I write about Russia, when I think about Russia, I often think about how I need to sort of restrain uh, the U.S. and restrain uh, the West from not exceeding its mandate when it comes to uh, the policy problem that Russia uh, presents. But finally, uh, whether or not Putin becomes more aggressive in the next year or two is for me very difficult to say, uh, but that he's weaker than he was two years ago seems to me uh, very much the case, and that in two respects, I think COVID has intersected with a bunch of domestic economic problems that are of long standing, the collapse of middle class, class growth in Russia, um, very top heavy state driven uh, economy, um, better I'm sure in many respects than the Soviet economy, but with some of its uh, defects. And at a certain point that's gonna just um, erode his, uh, his support and his ability to function uh, domestically. He's also been in power for 20 years uh, and um, you know, that just is a juggling act that's increasingly difficult, which is precisely what you see with Lukashenko uh, in Belarus. At a certain point, the game uh, is sort of up for these uh, for these figures, and that could happen with Putin as well. But I also think that Russian foreign policy, which looked to be very formidable a few years ago and is in a number of ways still formidable, uh, has been having a lot of failures recently. Um, mm. You know, Libya and Syria are not great foreign policy successes for Russia. Uh, they are, you know, Obama was mocked for saying that Syria will be a quagmire for Russia. I think he may have been accurate in that prediction. Yes, Crimea yeah. will probably always be in Russia, but uh, the Donbass is an expensive uh, criminal mess on Russia's doorstep, and it's of Russia's own making. And I think with Belarus, there's a way in which, we'll talk about the Western response to this later, but there's a way in which Ra Putin is kind of clueless in that situation. because He knows yeah. that Lukashenko has very little legitimacy. Uh, I don't think he wants to invade. I don't think he wants to make it a part of Russia. I don't think he wants to unduly antagonize the West, and yet he doesn't want to see a breakaway uh, either. So I think that there are these real weaknesses, um, but they may not necessarily translate into passivity or uh, 
<laughs> lack of aggression on Putin's part, he's probably as likely to lash out as he was before. And maybe in a certain line of argument, he might be more likely to lash out if he feels uh, insecure or or encircled. Sure. And, and if, if you wouldn't mind, just a quick follow up there, Professor. I was really interested at one point in your report. I mean, you obviously remarked that Putin has been um, Putin has been very adept at kind of um, um, uh, tapping into pro-Russian or even Russophile or culturally Russian sentiments in the whole of NATO's eastern flank. He did it with um, uh, Georgia, Chechnya. There's many examples, even uh, obviously Crimea. But you do remark in this report, I wonder if you have any sort of like um, kind of recent um, uh, knowledge there to, to share with us. It seems like uh, Lukashenko and maybe even Putin himself as well have been blaming the uprising, the recent uprising this summer in Belarus on one country that I'm really interested in particular, because you would you would almost think that they would lay this on the feet of the West in general, but they're very precise in their indictment of Poland specifically. I wonder if you uh, can share anything about how um, how Poland is perceived in, um, in, in, in Belarus and in Russia. I frankly can't comment on that issue in Belarus, I, I'm afraid I just know too little about the country, but I can certainly say a few words about that uh, in the uh, in the Russian domain. First of all, I would I would classify these sorts of claims uh, of Lukashenko's and Putin's uh, under propaganda. In other words, this is for um, public consumption. This is to make the conflict about geopolitics and, and and foreign interference, as opposed to Lukashenko's handling of the Belarusian economy and the elections and the sort of real issues that are that are stimulating the protests. So it's a deflection. Uh, and in that sense, you know, I would guess that Putin and Lukashenko are both smart enough to know that this is not um, this is not the real story. But it's a it's a narrative that, um, you know, it, it, it harmonizes with other kinds of narratives. Ukraine is the instance of CIA uh, American interference. That's this narrative over there. Even Syria is sort of a, uh, a colored revolution that Russia is valiantly uh, preventing and, and, and there too you sort of see a similar uh, narrative Western incursion Western incompetence Western malice and Russia is uh, you know sort of on the other side uh, of the barricades but uh, you know that's not the factual story uh, of the situation and I'm sure um, I'm sure Putin knows that um, it's in Putin's interest uh, I think to distract people from the real problems uh, of Belarus, and then in an alternate scheme, and I don't have evidence for this, I'm just speculating, if Putin is going to uh, involve himself military in Belarus, which is a very possible option, in fact, the Belarusian and the Russian militaries are already, you know, sort of integrated, this, uh, they call themselves the Union State in this in this respect, and it's, it's very different from Ukraine uh, and Russia, where there was not that sort of integration. So if Putin would either increase that integration or formally intervene, uh, he's going to need a justification for uh, for doing that, and so it could be the role of the Baltic republics in in in, in Belarus, or it could be Poland. In a sense, Washington, Berlin, and Brussels have given Putin very little material to work with. Mm -hmm. They've been much less engaged in Belarus than they were uh, in Ukraine in the late months of uh, of 2013 and the early months of uh, of 2014. Of course, the whole Ukraine crisis begins uh, with Yanukovych's refusal to sign. The EU association agreement. So the EU couldn't abstract itself from Ukraine and didn't really try to in 2013, 2014. And there's the famous story of Assistant Secretary of State Toria Nuland handing out cookies or bread or rolls. This the, what she handed out is disputed, but uh, you know, sort of appearing on the Maidan uh, and um, then in a telephone conversation with the U.S. ambassador that was hacked by the Russians and released on YouTube, she was um, you know had the phrase "Yats is our guy, Yats and is our guy," and so that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, did give Russia sort of uh, 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 ammunition for their claim that this was uh, a Western plot to, you know, sort of take over Ukraine. But you don't have that in Belarus. So he's got to find a, a villain that's sort of necessary. Uh, and in Russian history and culture, Poland uh, is sort of a splendid villain. Uh, it's mm -hmm. always a disruptor, you know, sort of a problem. It contributed to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, it was a huge problem in the 19th century uh, for the Russian Empire to manage the sort of Polish nationalism and Polish betrayal uh, is, uh, you know, sort of a common theme uh, in nationalist Russian uh, discourse. So if you don't have the CIA, you don't have Toria Newland, and you don't have uh, Brussels to blame, at least you have at least you have Poland and Belarus. So we're talking about how the West was kind of a, how Russia was somewhat of a front line between the West and, and, and the East, I guess, if for lack of a better term there. Um, could we could we go back a little bit towards the idea that 
the West could have managed to include Russia properly after the fall of the USSR. So there's kind of two dueling narratives here. One, which is Russia is always kind of Eastern despotic and therefore not adapted to the West. And there were all the reset attempts and, and the attempts to include them were worthless. And the other one is, no, actually, Russia really has this tendency within it, which is which could be included within the West. And we kind of missed the occasion because we were um, too, too, uh, too bold, too, too arrogant, too, uh, too dismissive. Which, which kind of these narratives think, do you think fit best to, to describe what happened since the 1990s? Okay, I'm going to offer three points and I'm going to contradict myself a little bit because it's a very hard question to get right. Um, and I don't claim to have uh, have the perfect uh, the perfect answer. So I think that there were uh, you know sort of two Western mistakes, and then there's one sort of quasi inevitability. So the first mistake um, was to misunderstand the end of the Cold War, mm. uh, and it, uh, it you know it really wasn't uh, Ronald Reagan who won the Cold War. Uh, it, it was. Uh, it, there's an overemphasis in, in the Western narrative on Western actions. It's sort of obvious why that would be the case. Um, but I think that there was far too little sensitivity for the way in which the Soviet Union's fall was a collapse. Now, of course, that matters what part of the Soviet Union are you talking about, for the Baltic Republics, for Ukraine, for the Caucasus, uh, you know, for Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Yes, it was a collapse, but it was also a liberation. Uh, mm. But mm. in Russia itself, uh, there isn't quite a Russia until 1991, uh, I think it wasn't experienced that way uh, by many people. And in foreign policy, I think you do need to have a sort of sensitivity for the other side. And so this narrative that we did it, we won, um, uh, it seeded, I think, certain dangers in, in, the, in the Western mentality uh, in, uh, in the 1990s. And the second point sort of follows from the first, which is that the phase from 1991 to, I'm not quite sure when, maybe 2007, when Putin gives his aggressive speech at the Munich Security Conference, or maybe 2011 when he embraces Edward Snowden in Moscow, or 2014 when there's really a clash between Russia and the West, the period between 1991 and let's say 2014 is very anomalous in Russian history. It's a very unusual phase. It's probably the weakest phase of Russian history or the phase in which Russia is weakest in maybe a 200 or 300 year period, or maybe 1917 would be uh, sort of an analog. The country was uh, administratively uh, destroyed with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, it was impoverished. Its military was, uh, in most respects, you know, sort of humiliated from what it was uh, during the Cold War. And if that's the case, I think you want to be very careful when you build your assumptions about Russia, what Russia will be. And I think mm. we just we ignored that fact a bit too much. We sort of thought, well, Yeltsin's Russia is what it is. Yeltsin seems to be conciliatory, he seems to be a decent partner, he seems to be somebody who wants to be a Democrat. Uh, and then you even have George W. Bush looking into Putin's eyes and seeing the soul of somebody uh, very pleasant uh, behind those eyes. Um, and, you know, there's a kind of optimism there about what can be accomplished with Russia. But that optimism too often was based uh, on, uh, I think, something of a misreading of what Russia was, was going to become. And at a certain point, the economy was going to return as it did in the first, say, eight years of Putin's rule. And then he used the surplus money from, uh, you know, oil and, and gas sales to modernize the Russian military. And so when you get to the situation in 2014, um, what you have is maybe not so much a change in Russian thinking or mentality, but you have new capabilities that Russia just didn't have 10 years previously. In fact, I think Putin was asked why he didn't intervene when the Orange Revolution uh, broke out in Ukraine roughly 10 years before the mm -hmm. 2014 Maidan. And Putin, I think, said, well, we didn't have the, we didn't have the military capabilities to do it then. Mm -hmm. uh, and so by 2014, Russia did, and Russia in a way became what it has long been, which is to say a military force in both Europe uh, and in the Middle East, as it uh, you know, became in Syria uh, in 2015. So that was a mistake that we just didn't you know, sort of game that out sufficiently and sort of see that Russia probably was going to go back to what it was uh, in the past and that this was a very... Uh, unusual period. So those were two, I think, analytical mistakes that uh, uh, made things uh, sort of problematic. Um, I personally, when it comes to NATO expansion, takes me to the sort of third point, um, uh, would not have included Ukraine in Georgia. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a convoluted, complicated story, how this happened. Uh, you still see in the, um, you know, political cultures of both countries, Ukraine and Georgia, 
uh, a very strong desire to join NATO. I think this was a step too far uh, and probably a tactical mistake uh, on the part of the West. But I also think, and this is my third point, that some kind of clash was probably inevitable uh, because we do not see Eastern and Central Europe in the same terms that Russia does. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's not in the interest of the United States or of Western Europe to grant Russia uh, an explicit sphere of influence there. Uh, and I think we just don't accept the premises that Russia has. What, what Russia wants to do is sort of to expand its territory and externalize its security problems. You know, better mm -hmm. to have those security problems in Poland uh, than to have them 50 miles from uh, from St. Petersburg. That's an old tradition in Russian foreign policy. Again, it's something that one can sort of predict, uh, but I think it's basically unacceptable uh, to the West. So there's a collision, there's a clash. Uh, you know, even if we had been much more polite with NATO and not expanded, I think that clash uh, would have come. Uh, so to a degree, we are where we are destined to be with Russia and where we have actually long been. We don't quite know what the border is between Russia and the West. And there's a whole range of countries that are sort of like chess pieces uh, on the board. Uh, and it's now a very intricate, complicated, and potentially very dangerous game about how Russia aligns its pieces and how we in the West align uh, our pieces. So I would criticize us for making a few mistakes, uh, but I doubt that let's say, a more sort of enlightened Western foreign policy would have landed us in a very peaceful or cooperative relationship with Russia. Final point I would make about Putin is that he's willing to cooperate with the West. He may even still be willing. He just came out apparently with statements this morning about he would welcome a Biden administration, would try to get nuclear mm -hmm. arms deals, uh, up and running with a Biden administration, which is, you know, maybe a, a mild surprise. So he's capable of that. Uh, but what Putin wants, and I think this makes him popular in Russia, is autonomy for Russia. He wants mm. the capacity to say no, um, whether, you know, going back in time, it had been sort of Kosovo at a certain point uh, or the Iraq war, which Putin was horrified by, uh, or the NATO bombing of Libya. These are all things mm. that Russia opposed, uh, wasn't really able to do anything about it. 2014, Russia said no. Uh, and that in Russia makes him, uh, I think, very popular. He wants autonomy. And that mm. autonomy is going to be very difficult uh, for the West to manage. And that's why we're uh, in this uh, in this very um, you know long term conflict with Russia. So I have I have one one question about you were talking about how 1990s Russia was probably its weakest since the revolution, and yet two decades later we obviously we'll, we will talk about how in the last few years um, things have become a bit more complicated for Vladimir Putin. But you know only five three two years ago it seemed like Russia had immense influence despite having you know. Average GDP, it's comparable to Spain's or Italy, and no, no disrespect to Jorge, but Spain is not a major geopolitical uh, heavyweight. Life expectancy isn't great. Um, there's high immigration, some a lot of brain drain. Birth rates are pretty average. Um, there's a decent military budget, but we're talking about light years away from what the United States can do or even China. How does how does Russia, despite all these kind of average criteria, manage to exert that much influence across the world? Okay, I think that there is uh, an answer to that question. Um, and you're right, in sort of empirical terms, Russia is nothing other than a, a medium power. Again, Obama, President Obama had referred to it as a regional power. Um, <laughs> and apparently that was irritating to, to Putin. But uh, uh, in many ways, that's that's the truth of the matter. And in addition, as we've just discussed a moment ago, Putin is engaged in this very difficult juggling act domestically that he has to provide wealth and services to his population up to a point. Uh, and he did that pretty well in the first eight years of his of his rule. And he's done that uh, more and more poorly uh, in the last couple of years. And that could potentially undermine his uh, foreign policy ambitions and his foreign policy capabilities. On the other hand, uh, Russia is, by European standards, uh, a very substantial military power. Uh, but even more important than whatever it is Russia is on paper, Russia is willing to use its military. Um, you know, it, 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 it put the little green men into Crimea. Uh, it um, made some combination of irregular forces and mercenaries and then actual Russian military uh, in the Donbass in the summer of 2014. Uh, it used its navy, its air force, um, and other, you know, sort of military assets to move into Syria and really change the dynamic on the ground to keep Assad uh, in power. It's engaged now in Libya. Russia has military plans and projects throughout uh, Northern Africa, uh, a few in mm -hmm. Latin America uh, as well. It 
those military, you know, sort of deals with India uh, and Vietnam, and of course Russia is a kind of partner uh, of uh, of China. So it, it 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 operates on a on a sort of large scale and is able to do that in part because it's willing to take uh, risks. Where that matters most, of course, is in Europe because European countries are very very reluctant to take those kinds of risks. And in the case of Germany, there's not even the ability to to do that. If Berlin would want to, they wouldn't be able to. You know, send some combination of mercenaries and soldiers to Ukraine. It just wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't work. So in the European theater, Russia, uh, you know, in aggregate is, of course, a lot poorer and may in a certain sense be weaker, but uh, it's willing to use what it has and to take risks. And, and that, uh, and also the risk of surprise and the risk of mendacity. Uh, mm. so Putin lies to Angela Merkel about having soldiers in Crimea. It makes Angela Merkel mad, uh, but it also gives Putin uh, the power uh, of surprise and confusion. So, you know, some of that works to the detriment of Russian foreign policy, I would say, but uh, in military terms, uh, it gives Russia certainly quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of power. In addition, Russia is, uh, you know, has poured lots of resources, as we all know, into disinformation uh, and espionage uh, and uh, into, you know, sort of virtual forms uh, of political manipulation. I think some of that stuff backfires. I think some of it is just pretty buffoonish uh, in intent. Um, you know, there's definitely blowback at times. Uh, but given that Russia's adversaries, in this case us, Western Europe and uh, and the United States are democracies, which are very open with lots of, you know, sort of dependency on social media, uh, it's a very, very open playing field for Russia. Uh, and even if we would want to do the same thing in return, and I think we don't, what is one going to do in Russia? It's an authoritarian state. There's no elections. Uh, the public sphere means something very different in Russia. We would really be at a loss as to how to manipulate it, I think, if we would make that uh, make that a goal of ours. So there, too, I mean, I think Russia is, uh, it possesses a certain kind of, um, you know, a certain kind of uh, weapon, uh, and it seems, you know, sort of quite willing to use it. Also, not to be forgotten, Russia is, uh, with the United States, the world's one of the world's two major nuclear powers. Mm. So any confrontation Russia gets into, that is a kind of backstop. I mean, maybe that's yeah. something that sounds a bit insane because you know who would want to escalate in the direction of nuclear mm. war? Uh, and I doubt Putin does. But I also am quite sure if the West had intervened in Ukraine to sort of prevent Russia from taking Crimea, that Putin would have been willing to escalate in that direction. Uh, mm. And that makes Russia a very, very difficult power to deal with. Let's imagine Israel would want to bomb Russian bases in Syria uh, mm. and sort of push the Russians out of Syria. Uh, Israel's a nuclear power, um, but so too is Russia. Uh, and, uh, you know, Putin, before he yields in some ultimate sense, is going to use every weapon uh, that he has. So that makes Russia very, very difficult uh, to deal with. It uses the military power it has. It's got these cyber capabilities that uh, are potentially quite destabilizing. Uh, and if we would really get mad at Russia, what we would have to face is the whole dynamic of uh, of, uh, of 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 sort of nuclear um, the whole dynamic of nuclear weapons, and that's as constraining as it's been since the invention of these weapons at the end of the uh, of the Second World War. So you know, in a way, the, the, the sort of basic conclusion is Russia is not to be trifled with. It it has uh, it has real assets and it uses them. And it's, uh, you know, I really kind of going back to, to uh, Francois' question, I, I appreciate you kind of delving a little, a, a little, the, the kind of attitude that, that sets Russia apart and the unpredictability of, of mm -hmm. Putin's uh, posturing there that really makes for, for a very unpredictable uh, power. And, um, you know, you spoke, um, obviously, you, you gave there a, a, a really, really comprehensive um, overview of what Russia does in terms of, you know, disinformation and um, kind of tampering with with our publics and our public opinion and even the prospect of them doing it with our electoral systems and and that really defines i think the perception of europeans at this at this stage of russia and of its of its malign influence in europe i mean we've obviously seen it as well on on your side of the pond but in in in, in europe it really you know there's there's been several instances where russia's and in, in, you know interfered in with with uh, propaganda um uh, you know, um, cyber um, activities, right? There's also the energy piece, and I want to I want to ask you. Obviously, there's been mo more, most recently the um, the what's what's been on the news is is Merkel's re refusal to kind of backtrack on on Nord Stream two, and I wanted to ask you kind of um, how you think 
that, um, it, well, first of all, do you think there's any chance that she may revisit her initial decision to let this project um, go through? And if she didn't, if she came around to the view as she's being increasingly pressured to do by her own political um, uh, kind of uh, uh, landscape is, if she came, came around to saying, listen, this is, this is our red line, there's, there's too much for us to, um, that, that justifies us kind of uh, shutting, shutting off this thing, um, how do you think Russia would react to, to such to, to that kind of decision. Okay, so I'll start a little bit with Merkel and then speculate about a Russian reaction to, as you pose it, sort of a hypothetical termination of the Nord Stream 2 uh, project. Uh, German foreign policy toward Russia uh, is really quite different from, uh, from American foreign policy and they really have the last sort of five to 10 years uh, in mind. Uh, US has a very, very uh, long record of conflict with Russia I mean, there are very brief periods of, uh, of cooperation, sometimes um, you know, sort of like the, maybe the Helsinki Final Act, where the, the West uh, or the U.S. Mm -hmm. and Russia could sort of sit down, U.S. and the Soviet Union, uh, and accomplish a few things diplomatically. But that stuff is the exception uh, rather than the norm. And I think Merkel took a very different view uh, of Russia when she became chancellor. Of course, she became chancellor at a time when there wasn't you know, such acute tensions with, with Russia, but I think her understanding was that there is a kind of historic connection in East Germany to the Soviet Union. Mm. Uh, there are lots of Russians who came and moved to, to Germany, I think it's one or two million, um, you know, sort of mm. ethnic uh, Russian uh, uh, recent immigrants uh, in Germany. And of course, business plays a big role in German foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, and Germany sees itself as the anchor of stability in Europe. And so I think Merkel translated all of this into a policy uh, of serving as a bridge between Europe and Russia, mm. uh, and then contributing, this is, you know, in German foreign policy texts, uh, contributing to Russia's modernization. Mm. So German businesses will go, BMW or what have you, uh, mm. they'll share their expertise, uh, they'll employ people, they'll help with business contacts, they'll sort of, um, you know, bring uh, the kind of economic excellence that Germany has and, and share some of that uh, with Russia. And this, I think, is an older kind of logic uh, at the moment, and there are similar uh, examples with, with Western China policy, but the logic was that if Russia modernizes and the middle class grows and the economy improves, the country will become uh, more democratic. And I think that that was sort of where she began uh, with Russia uh, with Russia policy. I think that relations with Putin uh, were destroyed in 2014 between Merkel and Putin. Uh, there's the famous story of Putin bringing in his dog to sort of frighten Merkel. Um, and, you know, the lies that he, he told to her on the phone about Crimea uh, mm. were personally insulting to Angela Merkel. And then in a very curious way, it's not just uh, Navalny, which I think is, you know, a sort of strange case with a lot of contingencies, but Russia used a pro sort of propaganda uh, episode where they claimed, uh, uh, you know, a, a young Russian woman uh, had been, uh, had been raped in Germany and the story was untrue and, and it was mm. perpetrated by Foreign Minister Lavrov, which was really, uh, really something. And then there was an assassination of somebody of sort of Chechen Georgian background and uh, in the tear garden. Uh, and it's almost as if Russia has gone out of its way in the last year or two to sort of uh, demean uh, and insult uh, Germany uh, and, uh, and the German government. So that's a political problem for Merkel. She has to deal with the uh, effects of that, I think of it more as a matter of sort of German honor uh, that she has to do something, uh, do something about. And I think that's the reason why apparently uh, Tikhanovskaya, the opposition politician in, in, in Belarus, is now living in Lithuania, but she was in, in Berlin yesterday or is there today and was sort of meeting with German government officials, which um, I think is a message to, to Moscow that Berlin's going to do what it wants to do. It's not going to, um, you know, try to curry favor with, uh, with Putin. Uh, and, um, you know, it's uh, in no sense sort of dependent on uh, on Putin's good graces. But Nord Stream 2, <laughs> I think, is complicated. If I had to bet, I think that Merkel would stay with it, will stay with it. I think if she had terminated mm. the project, she would have done it when this issue was sort of hottest at the beginning. Mm. Uh, and at a certain point, people are going to be distracted by other things like American presidents uh, mm. being hospitalized and the U.S. election and other things that are going to sort of take up you know, sort of media space. So she's going to be under less and less domestic political pressure. The project is 90% done. Mm. Uh, I think that there's a lot that doesn't involve Russia uh, with Nord Stream 2. I mean, I've just been struck, um, going back to my own time in government between 2014 and 2016, how committed not just CDU politicians are to Nord Stream 2, uh, but also SPD mm. 
uh, as well. So, I mean, of course, the Greens are uh, are opposed, and you know, <laughs> AFD, I'm sure, loves Nord Stream too. But uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's yeah. uh, uh, it's uh, it's you know, it's not just a sort of small group of CDU people who want to see the project to fruition. There's a, a broader mm. base for it. I think mm. again, the business lobby in Germany plays a role with this. Uh, there's the Fukushima reaction in Germany where they, you know, Merkel sort of um, very abruptly took Germany off nuclear power. So that creates, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. different kinds of dependencies on, uh, on, on on gas and oil. And I suspect, I've never heard a German say this explicitly, um, but I suspect that not having the, the, the oil and gas go through um, Ukraine just makes Germany feel more secure. It's mm. not a desire to damage Ukraine. Uh, by any means, but there's just a certain sense of security. The, the hmm. source of the energy is a bit closer to the, uh, to the to German territory and to the German market, and it gives Germany uh, a, a certain kind of leverage. I know we're accustomed to speaking of Germany as a kind of idealistic uh, uh, country that's committed to multilateralism and to, and to Europe, but uh, the term Realpolitik comes to us from Germany, from the mm -hmm. German language, and they haven't, I think, entirely forgotten. Uh, forgotten what it means, but I think it would be a strong sig signal to Putin, of course, that there are, uh, that there are consequences, um, and mm. you know that's his long-term uh, greatest uh, sensitivity. Uh, and in that sense, of course, it's too early to say, but there may be a, a way in which Putin's foreign policy uh, is irrational, uh, mm. is sort of bad for Russia uh, in the long term. That what he gets from these confrontations. Uh, is much less than what he might get from a more moderate policy uh, that still preserves this Russian sense of autonomy, but that also uh, integrates the Russian economy into uh, the economy of Europe and uh, enables Russia to, uh, you know, sort of improve economically. So he's sacrificing all of that potentially. And I think Nord Stream 2, if, if America would decide to, uh, to pull the plug, would be a symbol. It would be a signal not just to Putin, but it would be a signal to sort of the international financial markets as well that Russia... Uh, is increasingly toxic. So it would be meaningful for sure. So we have one quick question. Jorge touched a little bit on the issue of um, cyber attacks and disinformation and whatnot. And it's been a trend over the last four years, essentially since the 2016 election. We've talked about it during the, uh, the 2016 election, of course, with, with Trump. We've talked about it with Brexit. Even in France, I remember we talked about how uh, Russian disinformation had amplified the scale of the Gilets Jaunes protest and so on and so on. Are the Russians physical to dis disinformation that they're even better maybe than their Soviet ancestors? Is it just a technology which is that much stronger? Or have we just become internally much weaker to these kind of attacks and are ready to lap up whatever partisan stuff we read which kind of confirms our pre-existing bias? How come, how come Russia is, seem to be uh, involved in every single one of our democratic crises? Well, the Soviet Union was, was not so bad at it. I think where the Soviet Union had its real successes was in in Germany. So they did infiltrate the peace movement in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, of course, Germany was ideal because you had East Germany and uh, it was sort of perfect for espionage. But uh, and I'm citing here examples from Thomas Reid's excellent uh, recent book on active measures. But uh, there was also a you know sort of East Bloc Soviet um, manipulation of a parliamentary vote. Uh, in West Germany, and you know, sort of other episodes where public opinion was was you know sort of tweaked or or or, or affected. The famous example is uh, uh, the claim that the CIA uh, caused AIDS, which um, mm. was presented in a newspaper uh, by Soviet intelligence, and in, in in Africa, other parts of the world is still a very prominently held uh, thesis. So the Soviet Union wasn't bad at at this kind of thing. They devoted a lot of resources to it. They sort of cared about it. Um, and to the degree that they had sort of willing partners in the West here, you could go back to the Rosenbergs and, you know, sort of Alter Hiss or with Kim Philby or, you know, the famous uh, spy cases from the 1930s and 40s. And you think that the, you know, the Soviet nuclear program probably was sped up by a year or two by the information because of the information the Rosenbergs mm. uh, passed along. That's a pretty spectacular uh, espionage success. So there's all of that in the background. And, uh, you know, of course, Putin as the KGB operative that he was before the Soviet Union fell, uh, sort of celebrates that, is familiar with it, and has uh, perpetuated it. I think it's clear that social media makes all of this just a lot easier. Um, it's easier to infiltrate. It's, it's, it's cheaper. The IRI you know, sort of workshop in St. Petersburg that uh, involved itself in 2016, and no doubt there you know, may have a different name, but there are sort of similar workshops up and running in Russia at the moment with the election in the U.S. and other elections. 
uh, you know, I think it was $100 million or even less. I mean, it, it, it's really compared to what you would spend on one fighter jet uh, or mm -hmm. one nuclear jet. So it's, yeah. it's, oh. so, uh, it's low cost. In some ways, it's low risk. Uh, if you think of how difficult it's been to sort of figure out what happened with WikiLeaks and Assange and, mm. um, you know, sort of how this information was transmitted, who exactly is responsible, um, you know, it's it's agonizing when you look at the American debate about this because it's clear that sort of half the American public sort of believes uh, a false narrative about this. And so that just shows how effective it is to get plausible deniability and to sort of muddy the waters. And, uh, you know, that's an old espionage technique. Uh, anyway, there's an op-ed in the New York Times today by Fiona Hill, who was National Security mm -hmm. Director mm -hmm. for Russia uh, for much of uh, the sort of Trump first term. Um, in which she argues, and I think the point is is absolutely true, that sort of all of this stuff that Russia does is sort of as effective uh, as we are polarized. Uh, and in mm -hmm. that sense, I think in Germany, I don't see, I'm sure Russia, I mean, they hacked the Bundestag in 2015, and I'm sure that they yeah. do this kind of stuff in Germany and have phony Facebook pages and, uh, and, and do this. But I don't think in Germany I've seen it having much effect. I mean, there's Gilles Jean in, in, in France, uh, you know, also really doesn't seem to have taken off. I mean, Macron was very, very canny about how he dealt with Russian inf disinformation in his, when he was, when he was sort of campaigning uh, and he played a game with the Russians where he sort of, uh, um, you know, maybe outsmarted them uh, in this case. But I think France and Germany uh, are, are simply much less polarized than the United States is, or perhaps the U S mm -hmm. and Britain. Uh, and it just gives the Russians so much less, uh, less to work with. So uh, the policy answer um not that foreign policymakers are so good at dealing with domestic politics, but the policy answer is really uh, internal resilience. And at times, the policy answer is sort of ignoring, uh, ignoring what the Russians do and not taking it seriously and not amplifying uh, and sort of exaggerating. So I would say, for example, Adam Schiff in the U.S. Congress, uh, he always dramatizes the Russian interference. I think in a mm. way we have to learn to do, all of us, but politicians especially, they have to learn how to de-dramatize it, point mm. it out, criticize it impose costs on Russia for sure, uh, but maybe laugh at it and sort of poke fun at it and say, who, 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 who do you think you're really going to convince with this sort of clownish uh, stuff? I would much prefer to see that sort of response. And I think we'll just have to, to learn it, but uh, it will be easier for the U.S. to learn this post-Trump when everybody, uh, when and if everybody calms down a bit. So what, what is the way forward for, for um, uh, U.S. and Russian relations, or maybe more generally the West and, and Russia? Is it, as you just said, um, kind of ignore it, accept that Russia is um, is what it is and it has its interests and it will defend them and maybe kind of just work with them when you can and ignore them if you can't, push back when they push too far? Or um, is that the way forward or is, this, is there something else which can be done which can be more forceful? I, I, would, I would be much more ambitious than that. I think that we can ignore when it comes to some of the disinformation, publicize it, criticize it for sure, but in a way not take it to heart. Uh, almost the way you would tell a, a kid uh, on the playground if, if the kid gets bullied to sort of ignore it and, and not pay attention, don't let it get to you. Um, I think that that's fine when it comes to disinformation, but I wouldn't say that about uh, Russia as a whole. So I would pursue um, three lines of effort when it comes to, to Russian policy. And I'll speak from a sort of American perspective, because I think in Europe, the, the situation looks a little bit different. But uh, And this is... Uh, something that I think most foreign policy types in DC would say about uh, the situation, the first point, at least. The f I think that we just need to restore the transatlantic relationship. Mm. Uh, we need to make it functional, um, you know, treat each other with respect. Um, on the US side, put aside this, this, this idea that the EU and, and, and Germany, other European countries are a trade problem for us. Uh, you know, sort of put that to the side uh, and the whole 2% uh, is important, but there are much more effective ways of uh, of getting there. So revive the transatlantic alliance here. You know, what I read about in my book, the notion of the West, I think is important. Mm. Maybe we're seeing the twilight of the West in some respects, but that doesn't mean that uh, individuals and politicians can't make good arguments for it. Uh, and to remember that the West represents something important, whether or not Russia westernizes, and I think it probably never will, um, not to forget what we represent, going back to the very beginning of the conversation, liberty, self-government, uh, and of course, there's a security component uh, to this as well. So we will defend ourselves, uh, whether the threats come through the cyber domain, whether they're direct threats to NATO, uh, or whether it's Russia's manipulation uh, 
uh, and uh, military interventions into what we could call the sort of gray zone or the sort of in-between areas, you know, ranging from Belarus uh, to Moldova and, uh, you know, sort of through the Caucasus and, uh, and, and maybe into Central Asia. Um, all of that, I think, is, is, is sort of a crucial first step at the moment. Transatlantic relationship in the long term, a healthy transatlantic relationship is the policy response to, uh, is the policy response to Russia, uh, I would say. Secondly, um, I would restore the diplomatic relationship with Russia. This is something I've argued for uh, in sort of piece after piece after leaving government. Uh, this was, I think, the mistake of the Obama administration and of some European governments that because of Crimea, because of the Donbass, we need to isolate Russia diplomatically. So you see Russia kicked out of the G8, which I think was a reasonable decision. Uh, but then you see every bilateral, bilateral structure of conversation, negotiation that we have with the Russians uh, is, um, you know, sort of deferred or, or, uh, or just destroyed. Uh, I think we need to get back into the negotiating room with, with, with Russia. We did this throughout the Cold War. Mm. Uh, there were times when we were at real um, loggerheads with the Soviet Union, but we were able to also simultaneously, uh, simultaneously negotiate. Here for me, the great example is, as I mentioned earlier, the Helsinki Final Act, which is mm. 1973 to 1975. So Russia and the U.S. are fighting each other in Vietnam fighting each other in the Middle East and Latin America, uh, other places, but they were able to, you know, come up with a deal on the, the borders of Europe, which is, which was very consequential in 1989. Mm. Uh, and they also came up with a deal on human rights that the Russians signed on to in bad faith and then, you know, gave us Václav Havel and solidarity uh, and all kinds of important things uh, in the 1980s. Mm. I don't see why we don't uh, negotiate, discuss and have, I mean, the U S president and the Russian president should be meeting once a year um, it doesn't have to be friendly. I'm not talking about any kinds of concessions uh, or that you bow down uh, to Russia to, to sort of get this, but it should just be normal. And in fact, we do this with China, which is in the scheme of things a much more formidable uh, yeah. competitor or adversary, but we have no problem uh, engaging in strategic dialogue with China and, uh, uh, and having all kinds of conversations. So I would just restore that, not as a gift mm -hmm. to Russia, but uh, as an aspect of our own, you know, sort of national interest or uh, you know, sort of Western uh, collective interest. Thirdly, what I would do, so resilience, um, revive the transatlantic relationship, use diplomacy much more than we do with the awareness that it may not give us very immediate dividends. But thirdly, I would engage in a very different kind of cultural diplomacy toward Russia. Mm. I would get away from the democracy building, civil society stuff, uh, at least on the government level. Uh, and I would use cultural diplomacy uh, to create goodwill uh, uh, not with the Russian government, but with the Russian people. Mm. What you see in Belarus is really extraordinary. I mean, everybody neglected Belarus. I don't think we really had much of a Belarus policy in the West, and very few resources were devoted. The U.S. didn't have an ambassador there for a long time, and no NGOs and, and any of that. And yet, what do you see there? That when there's a sort of uprising, uh, mm. this protest movement, uh, it's in the spirit of democracy, and it's in the spirit uh, of, of taking... Uh, the best things that the West has and bring them to, uh, to Belarus. So what we should do is sort of enable the goodwill uh, that could be there. And that's difficult when you're sanctioning a country. And I think the sanctions do produce a lot of ill will in Russia, and Russia I mean, among sort of normal people. But we should sort of do what we can to create goodwill, not because it's going to change Putin's calculus at all, but mm. because there could be a moment when Putin falls or there could be a moment when Putin is replaced uh, where other options will come into view and you would want to give that sort of future potential politician the benefit mm. of that sort of Russian goodwill uh, toward the West. So I would use that that tool uh, much more than we do. I mean, we did that during the Cold War. So we would send Duke Ellington to the Soviet Union. Um, mm. and of course, they would send their ballet companies to the to the West for their own purposes. But we sort of did that, uh, and you know, rock and roll bands that went to the Soviet Union in the 1970s, mm. uh, and that really did, I think, sort of foster a certain kind of goodwill. Uh, that was money in the bank when things began to uh, yeah. change very rapidly between 1989 and 1991. So I would do those three things, um, but all under the expect expectation that the confrontation and the tension between us and, and Russia is going to last for a very long while. I think you've got a great article here saying uh, for new relations with Russia, we should send Rian and Beyonce to Moscow. I think that'd be, <laughs> that'd be a hit piece. Um, <laughs> but anyway, to go back uh, about for West, we talk about our transatlantic relation, but I think when we end up talking about relations with Russia, we always end up talking a bit, little bit about the relationship between, mainly about the relationship between Washington and, and Moscow. How does the EU fit in that kind of vision? 
we had Benjamin Haddad on the podcast a few weeks mm. back, and he's making a very forceful case for the EU to become a geopolitical actor, no longer a geopolitical playing field. But would the United States be comfortable with the EU becoming its kind of own independent force? Uh, or would they want to, you know, be more controlling of what's going on? You know, would you rather have kind of a weaker but closely aligned uh, Europe, or would you rather have a kind of more assertive uh, but maybe more independent um, uh, Europe? Well, I, I do have to answer the question um, with the current occupant of the White House uh, in mind, because yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I, can't, I can't erase him from the picture. So I think when it comes to Trump and the EU, uh, you know, he's done a lot to weaken that relationship. I mean. Uh, the kind of ambassador that he sent to the EU, the statements, uh, or some of the things that Trump hasn't said about the EU, uh, the ethno-nationalism, the support for Brexit, um, you know, all of that would indicate that Trump sort of doesn't take the EU seriously mm. and uh, has very low expectations from it. Uh, and perhaps for you know, his own political instincts, it's very difficult for me to say exactly, I can't see strategy in this, uh, but he would sort of be content to see or eager perhaps to see a weakened EU uh, mm. and that's what we have in the White House, um, and it's not something that I like to see, but I, I, I wouldn't want to ignore uh, that reality. And very possibly, should he win a second term, uh, that would intensify, that he would feel you know, sort of less constrained. And, and the fewer Mattises and McMasters and others around Trump, uh, the, more, um, uh, the more he seems to go in that direction of either just pure American unilateralism uh, or these sort of shifting partnerships with uh, similarly inclined governments, and that's very often, you know, sort of Saudi Arabia uh, and uh, and the Philippines and Brazil and India, rather than the countries of Europe, and certainly um, uh, above uh, whatever Trump wants to accomplish uh, with Brussels. So that's sort of one point uh, to make. Second point that I would make um, is that I personally would see would have no objection to what Benjamin Haddad is is hoping for, uh, but I think it will be a very long time in the making. Um, mm -hmm. And it requires a high degree of coordination. Uh, I can only imagine if the American states, uh, you know, it's a complicated analogy to compare the U.S. to, uh, to the EU and, and vice versa. But I can only imagine if Texas and California and New York had the ability to weigh in on American foreign policy, uh, hmm. how difficult it would be to do. Um, you know, the U.S. can't really agree on anything at the moment uh, in its domestic politics. And if we had to get consensus you know, sort of internally beyond what elections give, uh, we'd be in an absolute mess. And in some ways, I think Europe has managed that very beautifully. Uh, many, many situations in which consensus is, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, very impressively achieved. But, you know, you just look at the Belarus sanctions, um, which Cyprus was able to block, uh, and many other issues. And just, it's, it's not so much that the results are, are, are always bad, but just the inefficiency uh, and slowness of the process seems to undermine uh, the EU as a, as a foreign policy force. And I'm not sure what can be done in the next four or five or even 10 years to, uh, to alter that dynamic. Um, there's a sort of de facto Franco-German axis that can maybe in lieu of, uh, you know, sort of formal official cooperation, maybe replace that. But that to me doesn't seem like a great answer uh, either. And then, of course, there's the issue of how you would do foreign policy without a military. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, sort of France could be the de facto uh, military of the European Union, it has hmm. lots of capabilities, it has nuclear uh, nuclear weapons, but, uh, you know, again, that doesn't seem in a sort of practical sense, uh, a practical sense to work. So if the EU would engage in a conflict with Russia over Belarus, and Russia would start to escalate and sort of move in a military direction, um, what does the EU do at the moment without uh, the military, uh, you know, sort of capacities to respond hmm. Uh, in kind. And, and so it, just practically speaking, uh, the intent may be there, but um, the structures don't seem to be there. So um, uh, it seems to me very, uh, you know, seems to be very difficult. So uh, I do think that the U.S. is, is sort of an essential part of this, uh, this mix uh, and would be until Europe would make the you know, sort of budgetary and institutional choices to be independent of the U.S. Uh, militarily. So there probably isn't in the short term an alternative uh, to the EU, to having a good relationship, um, a good, uh, you know, sort of geopolitical relationship uh, with the with the US. And so in sum, <laughs> the European Union needs Joe Biden to win the election. That's, that's, that's <laughs> an answer. Uh, and there are better medium-term and long-term answers. And to be, not to be uh, frivolous about it, 
if by it, rather if Trump wins, you know, the best thing that Europe can do is just let's see this as an opportunity. That's sort of it for the U.S. Uh, you really can't count on this country. Um, it's too undependable. Um, you know, it's just and probably too mired in its own problems to be that effective long term. So Europe really has to do something. And probably if that pressure would be there in Europe, given how wealthy Europe is, um, mm. you know, probably it would get there. So, you know, maybe in a certain sense, you could almost hope for a Trump victory then if you would want to see uh, the result Benjamin is talking about. But uh, I, I still probably would go the Biden route for the short term. And we really want to thank you. We're nearing the end of our time here. And I want to encourage again, folks, to head over to uh, the abandonment, of, the abandonment of the West, uh, or its Amazon page, and, and purchase a copy. They're going to be enlightened. They're going to be. Uh, it's a deeply, um, obviously, a deeply researched and, and very thoughtful work of intellectual history. There's just mm. so many titles and, and authors that I um, only barely heard about, Professor. That you very, um, that you very thoughtfully explain, and you kind of trace this idea of the mm. West and foreign policy in a very historical perspective that uh, almost seems quaint now, but but it really goes back to the foundation of what it meant, at least at one point in time, to mm. be Western or, or to be a part of the West. Um, but then you're also, I mean, w- one thing that just struck me there in, in our conversation is that your your book is an elegy to the West, but when it comes to foreign policy, you're a realist. You wanna you wanna you want the West to deal with Russia as it already deals with any number of foes, China primarily, without the sort of overplaying the threats with more of a sober kind mm. of um, uh, sort of like um, a sober perspective of the the actual uh, threat that Russia may pose. Um, but I, it, the reason we were very interested in, in having you at, at Uncommon Decency is one of the things we were, we try to do is we uh, try to translate kind of the intellectual debates into foreign policy questions, and we try to um, trace the connection between the two. And that's, to me, when I read your book, I, I thought that was precisely what your book yeah. did. So that's why we were uh, very delighted and very happy that you could join us today. Um, um, and, um, you know, uh, again, I'll just encourage folks to buy the abandonment of the West. Uh, we will be back next week with another episode. Uh, and again, professor Kimmage, uh, we thank you so much for your time and we look forward to talking to, to you at another time in the future. Well, thank you to you very much for your wonderful questions and for your own, uh, uncommon decency, uh, in, in posing them, uh, and, uh, in, in your, you know, sort of very generous characterization. Uh, of my book. Um, it's an elegy. I just want to make this maybe as my very final point. It's an elegy for sure. And there's a lot of reason to be elegiac at the moment. I think we all feel that something is slipping uh, between our fingers. Uh, but uh, it's awful. also, I would say, in its closing pages, a pretty hopeful uh, elegy. The West has been through a lot in the last 150 years. It's very often redefined itself. It's encountered enormous uh, difficulties from national socialism to you know, the sort of Vietnam War to many economic crises. Uh, and what's remarkable, this is maybe the most attractive feature of the Western tradition, is how protean it is. Uh, it's capable of redefinition. Uh, and I can see many urgent reasons at the moment to be engaged uh, in that work of, of, of redefinition, whether it's in Russia policy, whether it's for the sort of future of Europe, or whether it's the future of the transatlantic relations. So I remain elegiacally hopeful. <laughs> That's such a good way to put it. We'll we'll we'll, we'll see if we can make that the the, the title of this podcast or somehow highlight of it. <laughs> but thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you too, both very much. It was great. So Professor Kimmage is out. Um, I thought that was a fascinating conversation, um, both on Russia and the kind of larger concept of West. What, what, what did you take from it? Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was, it was wide ranging. It was sweeping. Uh, Kim, Professor Kimmich has a way of um, kind of covering all of these different historical um, tendencies and intellectual tendencies that make the West, uh, the, the, the world that we live in. And one of the things that I really appreciated about having him was, you know, uh, even though Professor Kimmich is a American historian, he brings a very American uh, viewpoint to, to the issues he, he writes about, but he's uh, very much in kind of in, in our sort of wavelength and what we're trying to do here with Uncommon Decency. He's very much an intellectual. He writes about intellectual history, but he specifically focuses on how uh, intellectual ideas can be applied in the real world and how they, they are translated in the kind of the day-to-day um, uh, kind of a grinding of world world politics. So I think he really 
um, is right up our, our wheelhouse. And I was really happy that he was um, willing to speak to us. And on a more general level, um, you know, the abandonment of the West, I just really can't stress it enough. It's, it's a must read. It's one of the best books I've read this year. Um, primarily because it just gives you so much uh, material to work off uh, to work off of when you're looking at these world issues. It, it explains kind of why the West was appealing at a certain point in time. He explains how, you know, the, the, the interesting fact was that uh, the West, when you think of the West as a cultural touchstone, as an idea, it really rose to prominence in America when America was yet to join the West in the 1920s, when Europe mm. was, was um, plunging into the insanity of fascism, national socialism, communism. Uh, and, and just at that time, America, even before it was kind of thrust into uh, the vortex of World War, World War I and then later on World War II, um, um, even before that happened, um, the elites, the sort of the, the intellectual Ivy League educated beau monde, uh, these people were already very much in line with the Western kind of classical mm. um, um, uh, heritage. And that was that ha was manifest in, you know, aesthetics, something like the Columbian Exposition of, of 1898, I believe, uh, or uh, sometime early in, in that decade. Um, so America was very much a Western nation in its um, cultural kind of, uh, uh, in its cultural imagination, way before it became a Western nation politically. Yeah. I think the, the other concept, I think the concept of West, when talking about Russia was very interesting, because um, I think Russia is really that front line between East and West. I'll, I'll use Kim Image's definition here to, for, um, to stay um, clear and, and simple, but essentially the West being defined here, uh, which is somewhat contestable, but he, he argues West is mainly liberty and self-government, and, and the East in, in that sense would be you know, kind of more traditional um, despotism. Um, and I, th I think Russia is definitely on that fault line. It's always It was always seen as kind of barbaric eastern force by by most european powers until until very recently even nowadays perhaps <laughs> um and you can see that tension for example you know catherine the great is one of the more westernizing um rulers of of russia she had a deep admiration for france for example and yet all, all the, every time she would come to france and try to make diplomatic overtures the french would kind of ignore her as being kind of a uh, you know, some kind of barbarian, which came from 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 the north and or the east in this case, um, and so it's it's really interesting. In the end, Catherine the Great ended up being becoming one of the most fiercely anti-liberal rulers in 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 Europe, which is a fascinating shift from someone who admired uh, the philosopher of the Enlightenment in France. Mm. Um, and if you go to um, 1848, for example, the Spring of the People, you've got pretty much all of continental Europe revolting and pushing liberal ideas, except Russia. One of the rare things Russia actually ends up ends up doing that at that period is sending legions of troops in Hungary to help mm. the um, Austrian regime crush mm. the liberal uprising in 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 Hungary. Mm. So I think it's fascinating to see it has this kind of very Eastern looking despotic moments, and then all the kind of more Western looking mm. moments. Mm. Um, and uh, one example is uh, in 1861 when Russia actually sided with the Union over the Confederacy. Mm. And uh, and abolished serfdom at the same time. I think uh, exactly wow. the same time. And didn't just around that time wasn't the UK siding with the with the South? Yes, exactly, it? exactly. <laughs> so you know, sometimes sometimes a kind of East West uh, divide kind of becomes a bit a bit blurry. So I think it's interesting because even even you, you could see that 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 Michael Kimmage had a bit of a hesitation inside him. He he said he was a bit contradictory at times. On it is he has the understanding that Russia can never westernize fully, but yet at the mm. same time, he always wants to keep an open hand just mm. in case it happens. And I think that's kind of historically, that's a really interesting tension within, within, uh, mm. uh, within Russia. Yeah, definitely. And that, that's a really good way to, to close this. And it's, you know, it's been in, in my, in my taste, this has been perhaps one of the most enjoyable conversations we will have the opportunity of having, uh, with this podcast it's been really really enlightening and really enriching so we hope that our audience will enjoy as much as we did see you next time see you next week Bye.